This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery service that goes far beyond letting you do continuous deployment. Snap's first-class support for deployment pipelines lets you push any healthy build to multiple environments automatically and on demand. This means with Snap, you can deploy your staging environment today, verify it works, and later deploy the exact same build to production. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many, many more. You can also use Snap to push your gems to Ruby Gems. Best of all, setting up your build is simple and intuitive. Try Snap free for 30 days. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 162 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. Chuck is out today, so I'm James Gray and I'll be your host. With me today are Avi Grimm. Hello from Pennsylvania. Saranya Bart. You said my name correctly, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> and with us today is special guest, Steve Corona. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to uh, be out with you guys. Uh, thanks for taking the time, we appreciate it. Steve, since this is the first time you've been on, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. So I'm Steve Corona. I was CTO of TwitPic, the big photo sharing app for Twitter that everyone has used or heard about. Did that for a couple years, and now I'm at a startup in San Francisco called Big Commerce, uh, and I'm the principal architect there. Wow, cool. So TwitPic, that's why we asked you to come on today. It turned out to be kind of a big deal, didn't it? Yeah, it did, and it was uh, quite a roller coaster, you know, so we started TwitPick, geez, like back in 2008, so it's been, wow, longer than I can even, like, fathom how long it's been, but uh, yeah, it blew up overnight, really just took off and, and got all this traffic coming in, and what I had started with uh, helping Noah, who is the CEO at the time, we got in touch when the, the user base was really tiny, like 30,000 users, um, and he he really didn't know what he was doing and needed some help. And, and I really had no, no idea what I was doing either. I, I dropped out of college. I wasn't, was into programming and sort of computer science stuff, but by no means was I like super experienced or super classically trained and kind of spent the, the better part of almost five years just learning how to deal with all this traffic. And it was kind of like drinking from the fire hose because it never slowed down. It just it actually ramped up more and more and more. And so for the longest time, you know, for the first year or two, I actually had to sleep next to my laptop because I, I couldn't figure out how to get the site to stay up all night. And so my solution for that was, well, when my phone goes off because it's down, I'll wake up, roll over, you know, do some command line magic to restart it and go back to sleep. And and for like the longest time, that was my solution until I learned more and more and more and kind of figured the scaling world out and how to do all this stuff automatically, how to have better response time and how to deal with millions and millions of users. And eventually, by the time uh, I kind of wrapped up at TwitPic and parted ways, it was all automatic. You know, it's just magical scaling abilities where, where everything just handled itself. So it was it was quite a roller coaster over the years. Wow, that's incredible. You know, it makes me wonder, how much of what you did while you were there was learning on the job versus, you know, skills and information that you came in with? Mm, that's a good question. So I had a, a little bit of experience. So before TwitPick, I was at an ad network. And so ad networks at the time, you know, back in 2000, uh, 2008 timeframe were like the only web properties that had to deal with scaling. They were like, the forerunners of big data kind of getting into all that stuff. So I, I knew about like memcache and maybe some scaling terminology just from that exposure, but a lot of it was learning on the job. And right at the time, you know, nowadays there's so much information on the web about scaling. You can Google, you know, how to scale X, Y, Z, and you'll find quite a bit of good information. But five, six years ago, that really was still on the forefront. There wasn't a lot of good information um, a lot of that information was locked up in big companies like Google and maybe Facebook at the time where that kind of knowledge was built on the job there, but they weren't sharing it as much as they are now. So there was definitely a lot of learning. I mean, I, I learned so much on the job, but it was just that that information at the time wasn't available. It wasn't common knowledge. You know, now everyone says, oh, yeah, just, you know, throw a memcache in there and 
solved, you know, scaling problems are solved. But <laughs> at the time, it was, you know, that information just didn't exist. Interesting. So TwitPick was a Rails application, I'm assuming? So TwitPick actually has, uh, our Rails history is quite interesting. And I'll, I'll give you the short but long version of it. So when TwitPick was first started, when I came on to TwitPick at that 30,000 user mark, it was a PHP app. And it was uh, a really nasty PHP app, right? It was the, the kind of PHP that like maybe your 14-year-old little brother might write. It was, you know, spaghetti and lots of files and this whole nasty mess. And I had always been sort of a, a Rails guy and was like, yeah, I, I want to do this in Rails. But at the time, you know, as we grew, we just couldn't justify the switch. We didn't have enough uh, Rails programmers on our team. And the reality is that if you use Rails or Ruby, Ruby on Rails, you need more hardware, right? Like PHP is really convenient in the sense that it's the runtime is a pretty nasty thin wrapper over C. So it has, you know, has better performance at the cost of like really crappy code. On the flip side, you know, Rails, it just has more code and needs more hardware. So as CTO, I'm like, yeah, I want to use Rails. I want to push better technology. But the guys with the money at the end of the day make the decision that, hey, we can't, you know, double the amount of hardware that we have to support this technology that you want to use. So for the longest time, it was a PHP app. We built our own framework. We built our own ORM. And the the technical debt just kept building and building and building and building. And it was becoming unmaintainable to add a very simple feature. Just because of all this technical debt that we had, it was very difficult. So sort of as a secret side back project we had was a TwitPick clone written in Rails that we kind of maintained and updated, but wasn't public for, for quite a long time. And we had this just like private Git repository that we contributed to, you know, as we built out new features in the PHP app, we'd go in and contribute in the Rails version of it. And it was sort of just our way of looking at it and saying, wow, look how much less code we have for this, you know, fundamentally simple app, you know, picture sharing. There's not a lot there. You show the picture, you upload the picture and have an API and, you know, there's, there's not too much functionality. So replicating that in Rails is not that much code, right? It's pretty simple. And so having that to look between and you're saying, wow, we have this really complicated, you know, 100,000, 200,000 line PHP app, but look, we could do the same thing with, you know, 5,000 lines of Ruby or something like that. And we had that for the longest time. And we started learning more about JRuby. We started learning more about different technologies for deploying Ruby that were faster than PHP that would actually use less hardware. A year or so before I left, so that would be put us around like 2012, uh, we started really focusing on converting that PHP app to a Rails app to, to start migrating and moving that functionality in production to Rails. Um, and so at the time, right, it was actually a lot harder than if we had done it when we had 30,000 users because in 2012 timeframe, we had 50 million users, we had 4 billion photos uploaded, and there's a ton of data. And then you have to start thinking, well, the actual migration to Rails isn't that difficult. It's actually that data migration, right? Like Rails has a very opinionated way that database records are stored and what they're named and sort of the formats. So like simple things like, hey, in your PHP app, you're storing your timestamp in the wrong format and it's not called created at or updated at. You have it called like, you know, date uploaded and, and date changed or something like that. Like those small issues when you have billions of records actually become huge issues, you know, like changing that database field from one timestamp format to the Rails opinionated format uh, is quite hard you know, with that many records. But I still, I really wanted to get Rails out there. I really wanted us to use Rails. It, PHP kind of had lost a lot of the more forward thinking uh, development in the community, you know, sort of Rails and the other technologies out there. That's where all of the real big thinking was happening. And I really wanted us to, to get on Rails. So I said, well, how can we do this in a way that isn't sort of that big switch. It's not doing everything at once. How can we do it piece by piece? So I kind of came upon this thought that we need to start thinking our, of ourselves instead of as programmers, as just API developers, you know, API builders. And that kind of got me on the train of thinking that, well, actually we can swap out 
pieces of functionality with a Rails service one piece at a time without having to do the whole thing at once. So the first thing we did was we swapped out our thumbnail API, which was like the most amount of our traffic. You know, you go on Twitter, for example, and Twitter is constantly pulling from our thumbnail API to get different image sizes. And when you post an image, they just pull the image from the API so they can show it in line. So we're talking like 10,000 requests per second or something like that for our thumbnail API, but it's read only, it's pretty low touch. And so that's the first piece of the application that we replaced with Rails. And we used JRuby and Torquebox for that. And then from there, it kind of cascaded and we replaced each feature of the site with a sort of a domain specific Rails service and went from there. That's interesting. Okay. Did you end up with spots where you had like some data that was stored in the old PHP setup and some data that was stored in the new Rails setup? Or as you would migrate that section over, did you also migrate the data over? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I thought the way that we solved that was actually pretty interesting. So what we did was the first piece, I guess, to mention is that all of the services that we brought over initially were all read only functionality. We figured that was the easiest way if we, ha if we have all writes going through PHP and we have different parts that are read only, like showing it, displaying an image on the website, you know, that's pretty much read only or the thumbnail API while well, that's read only or the profile page read only. If we did that first, it would be easier than trying to manage two writes in two different locations at the same time. So we did the read only aspect and we, but we still had that fundamental clash between how our data is stored and how active record wants the data to be stored. And the way that we solved that was we actually made, um, we used MySQL for our database. So we used MySQL database views to kind of shoehorn the old format of the data into the new format of the data. And it was pretty efficient. There's a little bit of overhead there, but we could take our existing data and we can kind of transform it into the format that active record expects. And so then everyone's happy. We can have a really beautiful data model and active record without having to have, you know, all these oddly named fields that didn't really mesh up with how uh, a Rails app, you know, the, the sort of best practices for building a Rails app. So we can have those nice data fields, but at the same time, really lose that complexity of having a write come into the Rails app or to the PHP app. So that was our migration strategy. All writes went in to PHP and reads started coming out of Rails. And then eventually we did that big migration where we said, okay, we've got most of the really high risk, you know, all the read only stuff. That's where all of the traffic happens. And that's the high risk part, you know, serving 10,000 requests per second, that sort of thing. That's where the high risk is. The number of people uploading image, well, it's, you know, I don't know, something like 50 images per second getting uploaded. That's very few compared to 10,000 per second, you know? So once we got all that read only functionality out, we were able to go and then do that big nasty data migration where we actually convert those fields. And uh, that was just a lot of kind of MySQL DBA magic to convert the tables to the new format, um, had a little maintenance downtime while we did that. Then we were able to take that right functionality and do that in Rails. Yeah, I'd love to get um, a sense of the, the timeline a little bit. So how long were you kind of messing with this TwitPic clone in Rails kind of secretively and then, you know, moving on to like actually changing different parts of it and then doing the whole data migration? What was that? How long did all that take? I guess there's two different phases there. The The part where we, we were building this app or had our, our Rails clone of it um, while we were developing the PHP app day to day that was several years before we actually made the migration. So it actually started that we were going to rewrite the TwitPic app. You know, we knew that we needed a rewrite. So we initially started rewriting it in Rails because we said, okay, we're going to, this is the time we're going to do it all in Rails and we're just going to do a big swap. And as we started getting into it and building the core functionality out in Rails, it really became obvious pretty fast that with the amount of data that we are dealing with, there was really no way that we were going to be able to easily do a clean swap. It just was too much and too short of a time to take that big PHP app and swap it out with a complete Rails app. So once we made that decision, we're like, wow, this is not possible. This really stinks. You know, we really would like to do this in Rails, but it's just not feasible with the amount of resources we have right now. That got put on the back burner and then we did a rewrite in PHP. And that's when we 
created our own ORM layer, when we created our own framework and that sort of thing. And we, we rebuilt the app in PHP, but that's what kind of created that mentality sort of shift. We're like, wow, we really, it stinks that we're having to do this in PHP. It stinks that we're, we're having to build out this big app that we really want to use Rails for and we can't. And that's where that thinking of like, hey, let's, you know, let's start thinking about Rails. Let's start learning more and more about it. Let's get the team spun up on Rails. And so at that point, that was probably around 2009, 2010, when we first did that big rewrite. And then two years later is, is actually when we were able to deploy our first Rails service. But that in between time, we hadn't had that realization of we can do this piece by piece. We don't have to do this all in one big chunk, you know, replace the whole thing at one time with the big Rails app. And I think that's what took us so long was getting over that hump of thinking that we can do it piece by piece, that we can do it as services. You know, it was sort of a mentality shift that took us you know, a good year, year and a half to get to before we said, oh, yeah, we can just, you know, do our thumbnail API and that's read only and it's a small subset of traffic and it's actually not that much much functionality. And that's quite easy to do. So once we had that mentality shift, I'd say it probably only took about a month before we deployed that first service. You know, it was it was quite quick once you sort of uh, had that mental realization. But getting to that mental realization, at least for me and my team at the time, I think that was the hardest part was was realizing you can do it piece by piece in a safe way. And when you talk about that, you're talking about the programmer versus API builder mindset that you mentioned. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. I think as a programmer, you think of everything as, you know, how do I code this up? How do I, you know, write this together in, in an application? But when you take a step back and you're like, really, I'm just building APIs and where those APIs come from, you know, what repository in GitHub or what program or what service I have running on my machine, that doesn't actually matter. What matters is that at the end of the day, these APIs, they share, you know, the incoming user request and they share the backend data, but the actual program on your server that's responding to them that doesn't matter so much. So it could be in Rails, it could be in PHP, it could be in Go, it could be in Node. It doesn't matter that much where it's coming from as long as you're able to hook it all together. And so that was the mindset that that really allowed me to have this way of thinking that we can build services instead of everything needs to be tightly coupled in one big application. I mean, URLs on the, uh, on the web are just another API, right? <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah, it's just an, everything is just an API. And so as long as you can publish an interface that, you know, your users expect in some format, whether it's a URL or an API, like a REST API, as long as you publish this, this is our contract of what we're going to respond to. It doesn't matter who serves it. That's a great point. So JRuby and TorqueBox, that, that's how you deployed the Rails version. Why don't you tell us about TorqueBox and, and what that is? Yeah, so JRuby is really interesting, and I'll get to TorqueBox in a second, but everyone knows, you know, JRuby is Ruby on the JVM, and I think it gets a really bad rap because JVM has such untypical characteristics, especially coming from the sort of uh, Ruby or VM world where, you know, there's just consistent performance. It's either slow or it's fast, but it's it's that one performance aspect and and that's sort of you're like okay it's slow i tested it done where jruby is really interesting because the performance dynamics change so vastly depending on so many different factors tuning settings or even just how long it's been running for how how much of the code it's optimized and compiled and run through the hotspot uh compiler so initially we figured and we knew that we just didn't have the hardware resources or the financial resources to support running on MRI, right? So we had deployed, uh, we were doing the back. So the backstory here is we were deploying a separate application that, you know, we were working on a separate startup at the time. You know, we had TwitPick, but we also had a little test startup that we were playing with. And we had done that in Rails and we had done that with MRI. And we got a lot of traffic on that startup. It was called Hilo. It was a, a social sharing website. And using MRI for that with a lot of traffic, it was sort of our first foray into actually deploying Rails into production. It was low risk because it wasn't tied to the TwitPick brand. 
And when we got a lot of traffic on there, we said, wow, this is taking up a lot of hardware resources for us to deploy Rails with MRI. You know, we're not seeing the, the typical, you know, sort of number of requests per box that we'd expect with PHP. It was just, it used way more CPU. At the end of the day, it used more CPU. And so from that experience, we knew that when we went to TwitPick and we, and we wanted to eventually deploy this Rails app, that we would need fast, more hardware to support doing it in Rails and to do it in MRI. And so that always was sort of a, a point for us, you know, a sticking point that, wow, it's really awesome to use this new technology, but we really don't have the money to dump into buying more hardware. And then I started learning more and more about JRuby and, okay, it has better performance characteristics and wanted to know, okay, so what's the, the best way to deploy Rails on JRuby? And there's a, you know, there's a bunch of different servers you can use. You can, there's sort of, with JRuby, you have this hybrid Ruby Java library effect where you can deploy Rails on traditional Java servers like Tomcat and Glassfish, I think is another one. You can use these traditional Java services, but I wasn't too familiar with them. I, I had used Tomcat years and years and years ago, and I didn't have a good experience. So I'm like, well, I really don't want to deal with XML hell. I don't want to be writing all these XML configuration files. That's like so unruby like, you know, I really want to find something that that is Ruby-ish. And, you know, you can look and okay, there's Puma, but Puma is very lightweight and uh, was still very uh, experimental at the time when we were doing this. And so I was looking around and I stumbled upon this piece of software called Torquebox. Torquebox is a sort of a container, sort of like Unicorn or Puma for deploying, you know, a Rails app. But what it actually is more than just the container for deploying a Rails app is it takes all of these amazing Java technologies and Java servers and Java caching servers and Java queue background worker services. And it pulls them all into this, this sort of central box and puts a really Ruby like interface on top of it. So you get all of this really amazing Java web serving technology that has been, you know, in development for years and years and years and years, probably, you know, 10, 15 years of development of really strong work and scaling lessons and optimization. And putting just the thin Ruby layer on top of it to coordinate it all together and give you this really nice Ruby-like deployment experience, uh, I was sold. It, it did everything, right? It did caching for you. It did serving the web requests. It also handled, you know, running background jobs. So if you wanted to do something like resize an image in the background, you could easily do that. Whereas traditionally, you'd have to get like rescue or something like that set up to do the background jobs. Torquebox has all that built in. So it was a huge selling point. The fact that it was built on this awesome Java technology, another huge selling point. So that's what we used and that's what we standardized on to deploy our uh, Rails services. When we eventually did that thumbnail service, that first service that we deployed, uh, we used Torquebox in production for that um, and it worked fantastically. It was, it was quite amazing to use. I would assume that TwitPick, you were talking about the ease of background functionality and stuff, and I would assume a site like TwitPick has a fair bit of that for, like, probably resizing images and stuff like that, right? That's right, yeah. So when we were using, even using PHP, we were using PHP Rescue, which is like the PHP port of the rest, you know, the famous Rescue backgrounding uh, library. And so we, we had always really had this fundamental shift of, and this happened, you know, years before the Rails app, but we were at, at so one point we were doing everything synchronously within the web request and it just wasn't scalable. It was like when Twitter would go down, it would also take us down because we were trying to post comments and images to Twitter in line during the web request. And when Twitter was down, which, you know, back in 2009, 2010, it went down a lot. So we were doing that all in line and inside the web request. And so when Twitter was down, our web requests would basically stall out, you know, waiting for the timeout to hit, waiting for Twitter to respond. And it would just create this huge domino effect of traffic coming in, but we're not putting anything out. And so there's all these people trying to hit you, but, you know, all your servers are locked up trying to connect to Twitter, basically. So early on, we had a need for backgrounding jobs. So we did things like when you posted a comment, like the comment that we were going to post to Twitter, 
that was the background job. Or when you uploaded an image, that created actually several background jobs, a job to resize each size of the image we want to create. You know, there's a thumbnail and a mini thumbnail and an iPhone optimized size and a retina size and all these different sizes. Each of those gets a background worker. And also things like, well, when you upload an image, it actually includes a lot of personal data about you. It includes your GPS location if you take it with an iPhone. And we don't want to share that on the web with everyone that is viewing your image. So we need to have another background process that goes and pulls that data out and kind of sanitizes the image so your location and security, your, your location and everything is secure. We don't want that data out there. But all of these kind of mundane tasks, we had gotten really good at putting into background jobs. Another background job is like comment spam, you know, so when you post the comment, we actually kick off a background job and we say, okay, is this comment spam? Is it, you know, are there a lot of links in it? All that kind of uh, analysis was done in the background, trying to do the least amount of work we could in a single web request. So we can serve web requests really fast and we can do all this kind of busy work in the background somewhere else on a different server farm that's not sharing resources with generating your your website and, and giving you that view back. We want to get that to you as soon as possible. So what TorqueBox offered was that using Java threads, because now with JRuby, you actually get real life Java threads, real life actual operating system threads, not just green threads, not no global interpreter, interpreter lock, anything like that. You get true threads. So TorqueBox had a, a really nice library that was very similar to Rescue, where you'd have like, some function that you wanted to call and you would call like, you know, the model dot the function dot like async and bam, that would run in a separate thread in the background. So you can have, you know, in your code, say you have a, you know, a model and in that model you have is comment spam or something like that. You can just run that asynchronously in the background by putting async on the end of the function name and bam, TorqueBox grabs that pulls it in a thread and runs runs that code there. So it was really, really convenient because we had so much background work, because we had so much stuff we wanted to do asynchronously, having it baked into the sort of uh, the framework or, or the model that we were using, you know, the deployment strategy without having to deploy rescue or another queuing service and set all that up was super, super convenient, especially for programmer productivity. You know, when you take a, the more traditional route, okay, I have a new background job I want to write. You have to go and configure it and set up the, you know, the queue channel for it and then set up a new background worker class and make sure it all gets distributed correctly. And, and all this, there's so many like logistics that go into it. Whereas when you use it and it's baked right into your server, it's so easy because you just pop the async part on the end of the function call and now it runs in a background thread when you, so for just programmer productivity, it was super, super easy to continue doing more and more work in the background and not using the excuse that it's a pain in the butt to sit up to do it. I think that's a really good point you're making there that like, you know, Rails provides the web application, UI, database connectivity experience, but to any realistic app, you're going to have other things outside of that. Like, you know, uh, some kind of background processing is common, and you gave a ton of great examples, and, you know, or the ability to do periodic jobs to clean things out and stuff like that. So it, it sounds to me like one of the big wins you feel like with TorqueBox was that that had already been thought out, and, and you had these pretty Ruby interfaces that you could just use and get to those mechanisms. That's right, yeah. And, and also the fact that, you know, there's so many ways to do queuing out there, right? There's a bajillion different queuing libraries, queuing servers. Seems like every tech company has their own, you know, their own queuing server that they're pushing. And that's great, but a lot of those are so immature and so untested because you have just a handful of people actually using them. The beautiful thing about TorqueBox is that it is building on top of all these existing Java technologies that a lot of big enterprise, you know, Fortune 500 companies are using. And so because of that, you get this really great queuing technology that has been thought out for so long and that there's really good monitoring around, you know, with TorqueBox, you can use the Java MX, JMX, or something like that, monitoring hooks to hook right in and, and get all that visibility and data that you want from your queuing system. Very traditionally, you know, it has all that, that stuff baked in already. And so you kind of feel, I think, more 
I guess you feel more secure in knowing that like, okay, my jobs are getting processed and I know which ones are failing and I know if there's a problem pretty immediately. So the fact that it's just baked on such mature technology for me was a huge selling point versus using something like, I don't know, rescue is great. You know, I love rescue and it's come a long way and it's, it's getting pretty mature now. But, you know, back a couple of years when we were using it, it was, you know, GitHub wrote a blog post, here's rescue and the world started using it. But was it really that mature? Were there edge cases in there? Yes, you know, there were some problems and there are problems with any immature piece of software you use. So the fact that it was just baked in with this mature Java goodness, but had a pretty layer on top was so key. I mean, it was, it was really a gift, I think. And that's a good point. We still see a slight hiccup sometimes with using something like Rescue. Redis just seems to have it just screams and screams and screams, but then every now and then we see Redis like pause for four seconds, you know, while it sorts something out, and so <laughs> that backs traffic up, and you know, then you have uh, you have to be able to prepare to handle those kind of uh, short delays and stuff. It's interesting. Yeah, and it's quite a bad experience for your users as well. I mean, no one wants to load a page and then have it wait four seconds, you know, after you upload an image, if it takes 10 seconds, four, five, 10 seconds, whatever, for your image to get processed, like that's not a good experience. You, you don't, you're confused. Why is my image not there? Why is it showing broken? And then, oh wait, it appeared because in reality, the background job, you know, Redis was paused and now the background job processed and your image got, you know, uh, resized and uploaded. But that kind of short span is a really bad user experience. So it's, I think it's, it's quite crucial to have a, a really strong, uh, if you're using background jobs, to have a really strong background job setup. You know, it's not an area where, where you want things to fail silently. You know, there's typically with backgrounding systems, there's not a lot of good visibility. Like luckily Rescue has a really nice web UI where you can kind of get some good visibility into what jobs have failed and how many jobs are backed up or processing and that sort of thing. But a lot of the queuing systems, just don't really have, you know, that, that kind of visibility is an afterthought. It's not really baked into the system. And it's important that if you're using a backgrounding library or backgrounding system, that you do have that visibility because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, there can be a huge influx of new jobs and there's, you know, a 30 minute wait for a job that gets put on top of the queue to actually make it and get processed. And, and not having visibility into that is, I think uh, a big mistake and, and something that can bite you in the butt if you're not, you know, if you don't have monitoring and visibility set up into that. That's a good point. So shifting the subject a little, you, you took this app that had all these performance characteristic problems and uh, slowly over time you evolved it into something that was more efficient. Maybe you could tell us what were the, the big wins, you know, what were the top three things you did that really turned things around? Yeah, that's a good question. So this kind of touches back on what I had uh, mentioned a little earlier is that JRuby gets a really bad rap. There's a website, I think it's called Is JRuby Fast Yet? Or maybe it's just Is Ruby Fast Yet? And it compares, you know, different Ruby VMs. And JRuby on that benchmark and on a lot of benchmarks I've seen consistently comes in last place. And so the sort of kind of your initial reaction is, wow, JRuby is slow. Why would anyone use that? Just use MRI. That's what everyone uses, blah, blah, blah. But what I actually noticed is that it takes a long, long time for JRuby, especially, you know, probably more JRuby Rails combination than just JRuby in general. But it takes a long, long time for JRuby and Rails to actually become fast, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that the JVM is doing. It's doing hotspot compilation. It's kind of pulling in, dealing with auto-loading classes, and then, okay, now the class is auto-loaded, you have that in cache. So we would see, like, startup times where you'd start up your TorqueBox uh, server and start ha hitting it with traffic, and the response time would be abysmal for the first 30 seconds, 45 seconds. It would be terrible. And we're talking, we're sending it, you know, 10,000 requests per second. So it's not like it's just getting a couple you know, hits here and there, it's getting millions and millions of requests over that time span. And it's just responding very, very slow, you know, could take up to a second per page to render. But then over time, you start to see if you, you know, turn on the debugging logs, you see that, okay, it's doing all this stuff. It's actually like, you can have it print out every time it hotspot compiles a class. 
And you can see like even five minutes into the process, it's still finding pieces of code that it can optimize or that it can com compile into machine code. And so it takes a long time with a lot of traffic coming in for the JVM to even get warmed up. Like we're talking five minutes in, we start to see like actual reasonable response times. And actually, if you let it run for long enough, the response times get very low. We go from that one second per page, which is, you know, unacceptable down to, you know, 20, 30 milliseconds per page of this. We're talking about the same pages that we're generating just longer in the sort of JVM startup process, you know, further down that path where more and more and more and more of that, that Rails code, the code that Rails framework and your own code gets compiled and is more optimized. So because of that, JRuby gets a terrible rap because a lot of the benchmarks are things that happen relatively quickly. And so you're paying that huge warm up penalty without ever getting to the part where the JVM is quite fast, where JRuby on the JVM with Rails is actually faster than MRI, at least in my experience, that you can shoot out pages at scale anyways, if you're talking about, okay, I want to generate one page, MRI is going to be way faster because you don't have to pay that penalty. But when we're talking about generating millions and millions and millions of pages over the span of days or weeks, I think that the total aggregate time of time to generate those pages will be less on JRuby and it will take longer on using more traditional Ruby VM like MRI. So because of that, it was hard at first to like kind of get over that performance characteristics and kind of deal with things a little differently. You really have a huge penalty to pay on when you're starting up or restarting Torquebox. But there's still a lot of things you can optimize. So like if you were deploying with Unicorn, you would, uh, you would optimize like the number of Unicorn processes you have. With Torquebox, you optimize the number of threads you have. You know, what's the max amount of threads? And so that was one big win was like kind of playing around with, okay, we have, 32 cores on this app server. How many threads can we run with Torquebox? And I think the optimal number we found was like 3x the number of cores, but that's application dependent. Like how many times is your application blocking while it hits the database or while it, you know, hits the file system, that sort of thing. So we had to really play around with that was how many, uh, what's the max number of threads that we, we let Torquebox have? And so for our 32, 32 core server, I think we settled on something like 96 or 100. Then the JVM, right, is like you can buy a book on tuning the JVM and all of that stuff applies to JRuby, right? It's not really any different than just running a Java app. Um, so you need to tune things like the garbage collector and there's 20 different strategies for the JVM garbage collector and how you want it to run. You can turn on the concurrent garbage collector. You know, there's, there's all sorts of optimizations there. And, and that you can do some research and it, de again, depends on your application. How many dirty objects is your uh, application generating? If you have a loop where you're just, you know, creating a bunch of objects, millions of objects and then throwing them all away, well, your garbage collector is going to have to run more often. And that's something you'd face with MRI as well, but there's less tuning available there where the JVM, you can really, uh, you can hire someone that's a JVM garbage collect collector tuning expert. Like there's, there's a lot to learn there, and it's a huge, huge, steep learning curve. Um, I wouldn't even, you know, having played with it for so long with that, I would still call myself a novice because there's just so many different settings that have so many different fundamental impacts to the way it runs. And the easiest way to learn is just to test and break stuff and, and figure it out that way. So those were kind of the two areas where, like, on the OPSI side, we got more performance. The other side is just Rails and, and Ruby in general, um, where, you know, sometimes the magic or the expressiveness of Ruby and Ruby on Rails kind of can bite you in the butt where you do something that's really beautiful, but don't know or don't really consider when you write this beautiful code, what performance impacts that has, or just like the, the characteristics of of this code that you're writing and the way maybe it's hitting active record in some kind of loop and you're not doing it optimally, because the code just is so natural to write that way. But in reality, you need to go back and kind of denormalize your Ruby, so to speak, and make it a little bit less elegant at the trade-off of maybe only hitting the database once and, or doing something with less iterations or less loops that is less elegant, but at the same time gives you better performance. So on the Ruby side, we had to take a step back and look at our code and say, okay, what parts of this code can we clean up? Can we optimize? Can we have less kind of function jumps where we jump between 20 different functions? How can we sort of clean that up and optimize it a little bit 
so that we get better, better performance out of that. However, in that respect, sort of the thing that, that I preach when I talk about scaling, whether it's scaling Rails or scaling PHP, which I talk about quite a bit, it's fundamentally the same idea that, and you guys might disagree with me here, but your code doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. In reality, when you scale 99% of the time, you're going to get way more benefits out of scaling your infrastructure, out of, you know, doing backgrounding jobs, out of picking a better, you know, Ruby VM, picking a better Ruby, uh, you know, server to use, whether it's Unicorn, Puma, Passenger, etc. tuning your database, like all of that stuff is going to have usually, unless you're doing something horribly abysmal in your code, is going to have way bigger payoffs than spending all day trying to, you know, optimize your code to, to do something that's going to be one or two milliseconds faster Tuning all of those other subsystems at the, at the OPSI layer has way bigger payoffs. So in that respect, you know, we tuned TorqueBox, but we didn't really concentrate too much on scaling or, you know, optimizing our code because scaling your code in my mind just doesn't matter that much. So that's an interesting claim. I, I'm trying to decide if I do agree with it or not. Let me, let me talk about <laughs> it. Um, so my immediate response to that is, well, if you have something like, an O N squared algorithm or something versus switching to just like an O log N algorithm, you're going to have a huge performance characteristic difference there that, you know, no amount of, of hardware or whatever is going to fix. Or it may fix it for certain sizes, of course, but, you know, once you get to that point where you have a big enough exponent involved, you know, you can't fix that problem with hardware. So I, I don't think I would totally downplay what can be done uh, in the software. I do think I understand what you were saying. And, and I think maybe the way I would say it is like, you know, if you're, you're doing, you know, micro benchmark kind of stuff like, oh, well, it turns out making an array and using each is 50 milliseconds faster than just using a jet or something like that. If you're doing stuff like that, then you're on such a small scale that the gains you'd make there versus the gains you'd make putting it on better hardware or, or better tuning the environment probably just, you know, can't be significant. Plus things like programmer time is pretty expensive often, even compared to like hardware, you know, you know, to have time for the programmer to go in there and re-architect it to remove a few less calls or whatever can be expensive. Uh, so you have to weigh, you know, how, how much payout will that be versus, you know, just throwing one more processor core at this thing and, and that'll set us for a year or so at our current growth rate. So I, I, I think there's definitely a trade off to be made there and considered, but I, I think there's definitely cases, you know, M plus one queries are pretty common in Rails. So if you have a query where you, you know, fetch the list of items and then you fetch each item individually, Often you can just go in there and, you know, with a correct use of Rails includes or whatever, probably fetch them all in one query instead of 10 separate queries. And I think that has a substantial difference and loosens your hardware requirements. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I totally agree with you. And I, I think that you touched on a couple of good points. And the first being that N plus one is like, it's weird because in Rails, that is just super, super, super common. I think it's just the magic of, Active record kind of makes you forget about what the actual database calls you're making are. Whereas if you use, if you were writing that SQL explicitly, you know, in Ruby without an ORM, or if you're using a different language where the ORMs aren't so elegant, you don't see that as often just because it's more obvious what you're doing. So N plus one is, it's weird because even the best programmers, I think, sometimes make that mistake where they're thinking in Ruby and not in actual database or SQL terms. And the other part you touched on, I, I agree, but I also disagree as far as, you know, the algorithm performance, whether it's, you know, log N or N squared or, or whatnot. And I, I agree, you know, at the core terms, like, Yes, like you want to optimize the algorithms, you want to pick a better algorithm because you're right, like no matter how much hardware you throw at it, at a big enough data size, like there's going to be substantial differences there. That being said, I think that we have to, as web programmers, like think about it in the sense that we're not really dealing with that much data. Like in a web request, like there's really not that much data where the you can use, you know, the worst performing, you know, end to the fourth algorithm. And 
it probably, we have such a small amount of data per web request that we're working with that it really doesn't matter. Now, granted, there are definitely cases where that is going to make a huge difference. You have some, you know, API call that ingests a huge bunch of data that you need to process. And certainly, like, that is a case where it makes a lot of difference. But in general, like, a lot of web requests are just very tiny data exchanges and the actual, like, how that data is processed at least in that single request context and not like kind of aggregating it over multiple requests, it doesn't matter too much. So I think that there's like almost a disconnect between computer science thinking and web application development thinking because we're not dealing with a lot of the same problems that we think about when we think about computer science. Like we, we are dealing with such a tiny piece of data at a time that generally I don't see it mattering, but I do agree with your fundamental point, which is like, maybe I should take a step back and say, okay, you don't scale your code, you scale your algorithms and you scale your ops. Um, and that's where the biggest payoffs are. But like you see it a lot with PHP actually where people argue like you're talking about um, micro optimizations and you see all the time like people in, in PHP forums will say, well, you know, single quotes are actually faster than double quotes. So like I use single quotes everywhere because it's, you know, one millisecond faster if I do it a million times in a, in an iteration. And like people argue about these things. And so when I look at it, I'm like, this stuff doesn't matter. Like most of that payoff is so, 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 so tiny. That's not how people see all their code. Like if you go to Facebook or some big app, like they don't have programmers there that are thinking about, well, maybe I should use single quotes instead of double quotes. And we should, you know, do a search and replace across the whole, whole code base. Like that stuff just is such a small micro optimization that it doesn't matter because like you said, programmer time is so expensive and hardware comparatively is so cheap like you can get a you know if you think about it in just terms of financial costs like a pretty fast server with like 32 cores you're looking at if you rent it which is more expensive than buying or more cheaper than buying it if you just rent that server we're talking you know four or five hundred bucks a month it's pretty easy if you have a team of programmers to hit four or five hundred dollars in a very short span of time where you could just get more servers for cheaper than it's going to cost you to put all these programmers on that problem to do these micro optimizations. But I think people get confused when they think about scaling and they think it's about like finding all these little tiny tips and tricks in these micro optimizations when really it's that kind of grander picture of how everything connects together and optimizing those connections instead of optimizing these really, really tiny, non-important details. Yeah, I think you have a good point there that if you ever get to the point where you need to switch to single quotes because it's one millisecond faster, you've already lost, right? <laughs> You're already on the wrong side, right? And that kind of stuff just doesn't really matter. And I, I think I take your meaning on the, the differences in web apps. I saw an app recently that had this really complicated code, and it was doing this really impressive caching trick from the database using a global variable and it was really complicated and I had to go in and change it for some reason. I'm like, wow, why is all this complexity here? And it was to optimize, you know, how often this this list was being fetched from the database. I'm like, and so I was wondering, well, how big is this list? You know, is this a, a massive chunk of data we're pulling out of the database or something like that? And so I actually went and looked and queried the production table, you know, how many entries are in here? And it was 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, with 40 entries in the database, you can do about the worst thing you want, and you can't make performance go south, you know? So it was like, well, that may be a little overkill for this case, you know, and I definitely take your point of, you know, you can spend a ton of effort optimizing this thing that just doesn't matter, right? And That's right, yeah. There's no yeah. point in that. But we did, We tend to have, like, you know, I, I think most, you know, apps have their set of tables, their few tables where it is important, you know, where you have enough entries in there. In TwitPick, I assume you have several photo entries or whatever that entry is that represents someone's uploaded photo, you know, and... and at that point, you probably don't want to do in Rails like dot all and fetch all of them, right? That's probably right. Gonna, that's right. Probably right, going to be right. bad. So yeah, I take your meaning, and I think this is actually part of what you're talking about. I looked at that is Ruby fast site that you mentioned earlier, and it's pretty funny because JRuby just does terrible in every one of those graphs. But those graphs are all, you know, these small little benchmarks, you know, measuring this, you know, tiny 
thing that matters not as much, you know, whereas J Ruby's playing for the long game, right? It's playing for what can I do once I've figured everything out about this app? How screaming fast can we make it go after we have all the right information? And that's a very different characteristic that those benchmarks aren't really designed to measure, I think. That's right, yeah. And and not to knock whoever makes that site, but I do think it's funny. I, if it's still like it was when I last looked, at the bottom it says, like, these benchmarks were done on my MacBook Pro. I tried to, like, open it up so the fan, you know, does it doesn't overheat or whatever. And I'm like, wow, that's... Even that alone is, like, when you're benchmarking something to make this bold claim, like, is Ruby fast? How fast is JRuby? Like, I would like to see at least some, uh, a little bit more of a standardized, like, using a server with a lot of cores, right? Like, a MacBook Pro at best has four cores. I would like to see a little bit more of a, a professional benchmark done there versus, like, hey, I'm making these bold claims on my two-year-old MacBook Pro that I may or may not be playing a game on at the time when the benchmarks are taken, you know? <laughs> yeah, good point. I feel like with with regard to optimization, the the classic advice still applies. Um, you know, shut up and use the profiler. <laughs> I dig that advice. I, I I like that a lot. You know, I mean, performance issues can come from a, a variety of sources, but really, you know, nothing that you think you know matters because the only thing that matters is what the profiler says. That's a good point. And and I'm terrible about remembering to start at the profiler. So I'll guess, you know, which one's eating all the time. And I'll go optimize the heck out of that thing, you know, and shave like three milliseconds off of what's happening. You know, and then <laughs> go look at the profiler and it's like, oh, yeah, it was all eaten up in this other thing that I didn't even touch, right? <laughs> and, and in that vein, I'm curious, with JRuby and TorqueBox, did you find good profiler type tools for hunting down bottlenecks? Yes. Yeah, so actually, the way that we handled that, we kind of took a couple pages out of the way we were doing it with PHP, and we took more of a high-level look at it. And so we really used a lot of StatsD. We know we had StatsD benchmarking and timings and, and just incrementers everywhere in our code. I mean, it was just like we really used a lot of StatsD data you know, aggregation to get those more high-level views. So we can see within StatsD, like, okay, this request and this particular function is taking X amount of time. And we can see that and graph that and see it over time and see how different deploys or changes in our code and, and whatnot influenced all of that. And so because we had such granular statistics in that sense, we really didn't have to do too much profiling on the JRuby side. Not to mention, I, you know, my gut tells me like it's quite hard just because you have, you pay all that Java startup time penalty. Like, how do you know if something's slow because, you know, it's not quite optimized yet or if it's because it's actually truly slow. So seeing that bigger picture over a larger time frame is really was our go-to tool for tracking down performance issues and optimizing things and and just like kind of having that grand sense of how things change over time. That being said, I would have loved to use something like for that same case, I would love to use something like New Relic, but for at our scale, it was just too expensive to use. But really for big scale applications, I think you get way more benefit out of profiling that aggregate over profiling an individual request. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover about TwitPick and optimizations and stuff, scaling? Oh, man. We we got a lot of of scaling talk in this podcast. I think that people listening to this are just going to, their brains are going to be melting by the end just because we covered everything from PHP to JRuby to TorqueBox to backgrounding. So I think we cover quite a bit. All right. Well, let's get into some picks. Let's do some picks. Opti, you want to start us off? Sure. Just got some technical picks this time. My first pick is Zurb Foundation. Uh, it is a front-end uh, framework, I guess. I don't even know what these things are called. Anyway, it's basically like Twitter Bootstrap, except it's by a different company. And uh, it is also open source. It also tries to be a nice framework to build on when you're getting a, a site first set up. It has you know responsive grid stuff and widgets and typography and stuff. I'm not super good with the whole front end thing, but anyway, I've used it a few times. 
and I've been impressed with it. The last time I compared it to Twitter Bootstrap, one of the reasons I liked it and that I picked it for a project was that it seemed like it had less markup you had to do in order to be compliant with its CSS ex- expectations. So, like, I remember with Twitter Bootstrap, I had to make a whole lot of changes to a form that I had before it started looking like a Twitter Bootstrap form, whereas with Zurb Foundation, I could pretty much just use the form that I already had with maybe one or two tweaks. So that kind of impressed me. The other thing I like about it is that the whole thing is is authored in SAS. So if you know and like SAS for creating your style sheets, you know, it's all basically a bunch of SAS plugins. So if you know, you know, it's really easy to extend. You can just like do your own classes, but then extend it with Zurb Foundation classes. And, and that's pretty neat. So yeah, Zurb Foundation my, is my first pick. Um, another little front end JavaScripty pick is Bigfoot, Bigfoot.js. It's a little library for presenting footnotes in HTML pages. And the neat thing about it is it just works. I was trying it out with the output of Pandoc when you take, when using Pandoc to turn a uh, markdown into HTML. And it just recognized whatever tags that Pandoc uses to extend markdown with, with footnote support and automatically like turn them into pretty little clickable footnote, footnote pop up things. And I thought that was super cool. Uh, because I didn't have to think about it. So, um, yeah, bookfoot, bigfoot.js. Uh, oh, I'll throw another one in here, which is Bower. Bower is like this emerging standard for front end packaging. It's like if you have something like Bigfoot or Foundation or anything else that has a bunch of CSS and JavaScript, there is now finally a sane way of just specifying in your project. These are the, the third party front end packages that I want to depend on. And these are the versions that I want. And you can just run something and it'll download them all into your project and then you can, you can use them. And that whole thing used to be completely insane when you had to just like go to every project site and grab their zip file or download their repo and unpack it into your project and keep up with the version changes and stuff. It does dependencies and everything. So when you get foundation, you're automatically getting jQuery as well and stuff like that. That has been making my life easier. I think I'm done now. <laughs> awesome. Saran? Sure. Um, I have two. Um, one is I just finished reading the book uh, Girl Boss by Sophia Amoruso, who started Nasty Gal, um, which is like an online uh, vintage uh, clothing store. And I love this book so much. And if you're not a boss and you're not a girl, you should still read it. When I went to look at it, the, the first page had a, a picture, like an illustration of, I assume, her um, smoking a cigarette. And it says, it says, the only thing I smoke is my competition. And I was just like, mic drop, I have to get this book. This is amazing. And it's just as badass as it sounds. Um, so that's my first pick. Uh, my second pick is something just more fun. Uh, it's a website that my friend Dan actually pointed me to. It's called 808cube.com. And it is this, it looks like a Rubik's Cube, and you can do like drum beats on it um, and music, and it lights up, and it's really interactive. And it is just a huge distraction and an awesome waste of time. So I highly recommend that, that you check that out. Okay, I've got a couple of picks this week. Actually, I didn't have hardly any, but a buddy of mine has shown me several cool things lately. So thanks, Paul, for these picks. The first one, in the spirit of the discussion we just had about scaling, it turns out if all you're going to do is pull some data out of Postgres and JSONify it and shove it back down in like some kind of API, you can actually skip a step by just having Postgres pull out what you want as JSON. Uh, and it can do that, and it's amazing. It's super cool. So I'll link to the article that shows how to do that. Neat stuff. And then for fun, there's this YouTube channel called Scott Bradley Loves Ya. And uh, just these super cool songs like Vintage, Call Me Maybe, uh, or a mashup called Bohemian Rhapsody and Blues. So like a mashup between Queen and Gershwin. And that's every bit as cool as it sounds. So yeah, total time waster. But I, I promise you go to the site, you'll be listening to a whole bunch of the songs on here. You definitely got to check it out. So those are my picks. Steve, what have you got for us? Hey, yeah, so I have a couple I can share on the topic of scaling. One is a configuration management service that I just saw recently, and I think it's made by the guy that makes Vagrant, and it's called Council, council council.io, and it's this really neat way where you can dynamically configure like your MySQL server IP address, and it will turn that into a fully qualified DNS host name that you can use 
in your application, but say, you know, you have a D, uh, MySQL failover and you need to change boxes, console.io lets you kind of dynamically reset the IP of that MySQL server. And then all the applications that are using the DNS host name provided by console get that change, like without ha- you having to change it in your Ruby configuration and redeploy your application. It's like this really nice config service. So console.io, that looks really cool. The other thing is we talked about backgrounding jobs, and there's this really awesome asynchronous work queue by the guys that make Bitly. It's called NSQ, and it's at nsq.io. And NSQ is this really amazing distributed, you know, background work queue that you install on a bunch of servers. It's really, really low overhead because it's written in Go. And it has great visibility, has this really awesome admin UI. And you put work into that queue and it can come back and post it to your uh, web apps. You can just write API calls, like an API call to resize an image and you can put that work into NSQ and it will come back and post it to your API and do that work asynchronously like via HTTP. It's really, really, really slick. So check that out. And the last one I'll give the last pick is non-technical, but it's my favorite book of all time. I've always struggled with procrastination and resistance. And there's this really awesome, really, really, really short book called The War of Art. So kind of like a play on the art of war. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And it's this amazing book on procrastination and resistance. And it's a short read. It's like 80 pages. And the chapters are only like two or three pages long. And it talks about this guy who's now a very, very famous author and his struggle with writing for like the past 20 years and how he just would fail over and over and over and over again and how he kind of finally broke through that resistance. And the book is like so inspiring. You can read it over and over and over again every time you kind of feel like, oh, I'm just not getting a lot of stuff done. Oh, I'm procrastinating a lot. And like I said, I've always struggled with procrastination like I think many people in the tech field have. Um, so for me, my favorite book, The War of Art. And those are all the picks that I have. Awesome. Thank you very much. I want to thank Steve for coming on the show and talking to us and telling us all about the great scaling uh, that he did at TwitPic and and everything we can learn from that. So thank you, Steve. Yeah, you're you're so welcome. You You guys are so welcome. By the way, if anyone listening to this, if you want to come work with me at Big Commerce, we're in San Francisco and we're hiring engineers, Ruby engineers, Go engineers, and PHP engineers like crazy. Send me an email or hit me on Twitter, and I'll get you like the VIP treatment, and you can come uh, come work with me in San Francisco. Sounds awesome. Before we close this up, I want to mention we are doing our book club, and we are reading Refactoring Ruby Edition. Uh, that's the Addison Wesley series book, so it's got the, the red cover you're probably used to seeing if you uh, read Ruby books. There is a kind of companion workbook you may want to work through called Refactoring in Ruby. That one has spaghetti on the cover, so I guess it's the spaghetti book. And those are what we're reading. We're working on setting up a date for that to talk with the authors, so we'll get that set and let you know when the episode's going to be, but you've got time to pick up the books now and follow along. And I think that's it for us, so we will call it quits here and see you next week. Bye-bye. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip. CodeShip is a hosted continuous deployment service that just works. Set up continuous integration in a few steps and automatically deploy when all your tests have passed. CodeShip has great support for a lot of languages and test frameworks. It integrates with GitHub and Bitbucket and lets you deploy cloud services like Heroku, AWS, Nojitsu, Google App Engine, or your own servers. Start with their free plan. Setup only takes three minutes. CodeShip, continuous deployment made simple. A special thanks to HoneyBadger.io for sponsoring Ruby Rogues. They do exception monitoring, uptime, and performance metrics and are an active part of the Ruby community. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the Rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor.